So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, this afternoon's uh, RSA webinar, um, the next in the series for medical undergraduates. Um, my name is uh, Mr. Will Finch, and I'm a consultant urological surgeon from the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital um, in Norfolk in the UK. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, the Royal College of Edinburgh and the RSA Network for the opportunity to allow myself and my colleague Stuart Irvin to put on this webinar for you this afternoon. So Stuart Irving um, is a consultant urological surgeon with an interest in stone disease and bladder outflow surgery. And the topic of his webinar this afternoon is um, aids to managing bladder outflow obstruction. Um, talk to me about 20 minutes. Um, there's the opportunity for you to post questions using the Q&A facility, and I'd encourage you to do that. And we'll do, uh, do our best to answer as many of those um, at the end of the session. Um, for those uh, of you who uh, see a question that you like and wanted to ask it, use the thumbs up symbol uh, to popularise that, uh, and that knows that that's a, an important question for us. Um, the next webinar will be on the 5th of May, and that's an overview of the management of acute, di acute diverticular disease, the next in the series. Um, but this afternoon, it's bladder outflow surgery and bladder outflow obstruction. And with no further ado, I'll hand you over to Stuart Irving. Great. Thank you very much, Will, for your kind introduction. So this is the seventh webinar uh, put on by the Regional Surgical Advisors of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, and I hope that you enjoy it. Today, we will be talking about bladder outlet obstruction, and at the end of this 20 minutes, I'd really like you to be able to understand what the commonest causes of bladder outlet obstruction are, why taking a history is important, so you can differentiate between the storage and the voiding symptoms. We'll talk about examination, why it's important, what to look for, and how to interpret your clinical findings. There are some investigations which are available in clinic. We'll discuss these, and again, how to interpret them. And then finally, we'll talk about treatment. So we have the opportunity to talk about both surgical and non-surgical care of men with bladder outlet obstruction. This is a super diagram. This is taken from the European Association of Urology Guidelines for non neurogenic male LUDs. And I think it's super because it just highlights how many different causes there are of low urinary tract symptoms. So you can have bladder outlet obstruction, or known in Europe as benign prostatic obstruction, an underactive bladder, an overactive bladder, perhaps a problem with your ADH production at night, and then things which are quite different, a distal ureteric stone, a bladder tumour, or a stricture from previous surgery. So it's important to appreciate that there are many potential causes of bladder outlet obstruction, causing lower urinary tract symptoms. For those of you who are purists and like it, a definition, then bladder outlet obstruction is a generic term for obstruction. But it's only obstruction during voiding. And you can only measure this by simultaneously recording the bladder pressure and the flow rate. So if you have a high pressure and a low flow, that will meet the criteria for bladder outlet obstruction. But for most people, it's a clinical diagnosis. This is only a diagnosis which you can make with urodynamics. And most patients would rather avoid those if at all possible. And quite uncomfortable investigations to, to undertake. So we're going to talk about a man called Ron, and we'll talk about history taking, examination, investigation, and then how to manage Ron. So there will be some polls through this, so please do use the polls. So first of all, history. Now, UEA is quite famous for its communication skills, and I'm not going to talk about communication skills today. This is not about the process of taking history. This is about the content. And when I look through, through my notes and my colleagues' notes, we tend to record the same sorts of things. The number of voids people have a day and night, and that's night from when they fall asleep, hesitancy, flow, post-maturation dribble, frequency, urgency, urgent continence, visible hematuria and infections. 
So what do each of these mean? Well, the number of voids per day and night gives you an idea of how much of a problem the patient has, how troublesome it is to them. And clearly going six or seven times a day and once at night is not really a problem. But going out 10, 15, 20 times a day and four, five, six times at night is an issue. Hesitancy and poor flow. Are they prostate related? Does the patient have a previous history of, say, a urology operation, a stricture perhaps, or having had a pelvic fracture? What's the cause of their frequency? Why are they going so often? Is their bladder emptying normally? And similarly, if they are going very frequently, do they have urgency and urgent consonants? Now, urgency is described as the inability to postpone maturation. But typically people say, I couldn't wait. And I always ask people, what do you do when you get home and you put the key in the door? And if they say, I get dreadful urgency at that time, that's a good definite, that's a, that's a, a good way to, to say that they have urgency. And then I always ask them, uh, uh, do they leak? And it's important to know if they do have an, an overactive bladder, is it a primary bladder problem? And in a primary overactive bladder, what normally happens is as the bladder fills up, it will stay relaxed. So the tension in the wall remains low. And this is with a process called receptive relaxation. But in an overactive bladder, as the bladder begins to fill, you'll get some contraction waves spreading around the bladder. And this puts a pressure rise in the bladder and that's felt by the peeing center in the brain. This can be a primary bladder problem or it can be secondary to obstruction. So if the prostate is causing an obstruction to the bladder, the bladder has to work harder to empty. And in doing so, the bladder wall becomes thickened and can behave abnormally. So this is secondary overactivity. I always ask about blood, just in case you, well, you don't want to miss a cancer, and infections as a complication of bladder wall obstruction. At the end of taking a history, you should be able to categorise people into either voiding or storage symptoms, which broadly speaking are prostate related symptoms, obstructive or bladder related symptoms, the storage symptoms. So here's Ron. He voids 12 times a day, three times at night, waits for his stream to start, spends a long time peeing, he says he's got no pressure, he stops and starts, he strains to squeeze his hair out, he never feels empty, but he never leaks and he can hold on to his water okay. So using the poll, how would you categorize this man's symptoms? So we've got some few storage symptoms, some mixed symptoms, and the majority of you have said voiding symptoms. I agree with the majority of you, as it being voiding symptoms? Because he had hesitancy and poor flow, and he didn't have much in the way of urgency or urgent consonants. So I thought he had predominantly voiding symptoms, which are all uh, obstructive in nature. So some examination. Um, feel, the, feel the tummy to see if you can feel the bladder. If you can feel the bladder, he's probably got a very large residual. I always examine the prostate. So you do a digital rectal examination, a DRE, which is good to say to address how big the prostate is. If it feels big, it probably is. And if it feels small, it probably is. But we know that examination and the estimation of volume correlates poorly to more accurate measurements such as an MRI. If the prostate feels hard or irregular, think about prostate cancer. And again, I always do a urine analysis to look for blood. And if blood persists, that should be investigated as a separate entity. PSA. PSA can be very difficult for patients and it's difficult for urologists knowing what to do with it sometimes. It's a surrogate marker of prostate volume. So if you have a low PSA, you're more likely to have a small benign prostate. And if you know the prostate is benign and the PSA is higher, it just means the prostate is larger. PSA can be helpful in the detection of prostate cancer as well as its follow-up. So if the PSA is outside the age-specific range for a patient, that should be investigated as a separate entity. And interestingly, PSA is also helpful in predicting outcome. If your PSA is over 1.4, 
then you stand a higher chance of the disease progressing and getting worse, needing surgery, having a complication of treatment, and a better response to some of the medication that shrinks the prostate. These are some paper investigations which are very helpful. An IPSS International Prostate Symptom Score Sheet won't make a diagnosis of bladder and obstruction, but it will tell you how bad people's symptoms are. And the interesting thing is the quality of life down here. So if patients say their quality of life is terrible, they're much more likely to end up having surgery than if they were happy or pleased. These patients are much more likely to have conservative management or tablets. The grateful follower, after you've started treatment, you can repeat them in six or 12 months. In the investigation that's helpful is a frequency volume chart, otherwise known as a bladder diary. In this, you have times and then days, and we generally do it for about three days. So when the patient has a pee, they measure it in mils. So say at four o'clock, five o'clock, they pass 100 mils, they record it here, 200 mils here, and then you can tot it up over 24 hours. So if patients have a huge volume of urine because they're drinking too much, that can explain their symptoms. And similarly, if they're passing low volumes very frequently, say 100 mils every two hours, that may be due to the bladder not emptying normally, or perhaps they've got a very overactive bladder. And you can differentiate those by doing a bladder scan. This is a test you can do in outpatients. So this is a bladder scan. It's a fantastic piece of kit. You put some jelly on the suprapubic area, and then you take this handle here, you put that over the suprapubic handle, and then there's a little button to press. And it tells you how much fluid is in the bladder. So if a patient has frequency, and they're passing small volumes, say every two hours, 100 mils, you can easily see if they've got an overactive bladder, when the bladder empties normally, or have they got an incompletely empty bladder, say the residual of say maybe three or even 400 mils. We often do a bladder scan in conjunction with a flow rate. This is where you pee down the funnel and it measures the flow in mils per second versus time. So normally you start your flow, the flow builds up pretty quickly up to a peak and then you finish your pee generally within about 30 seconds. The green line shows bladder outlet obstruction. So the astute will notice that there are some hesitancy here. So the patient waits a bit and the flow starts, it's a bit slow and it builds up and it gets a bit slower and it strains a bit and it stops and starts a bit and then it just carries on for quite a long time. That's a typical flow for bladder outlet obstruction. And then the purple line is a stricture. So this is somebody who's got scar tissue in the urethra or water pipe. The flow starts at a normal pace, the upstroke is normal, and the top is a plateau. And that's very characteristic. So you can diagnose a stricture just from the flow rate. So treatments. Those patients whose symptoms aren't too troublesome can have observation and maybe a review in a year's time. Or diet and lifestyle changes, drinking a bit less tea, a bit less coffee, drink a bit less alcohol. And that can be very helpful in managing people's symptoms. Some people would use phytotherapy or plant-based therapies that they can buy over the counter. Saw palmetto is the most popular, and this is a picture of saw palmetto growing in Florida. Many people will use conventional medications. And these include alpha blockers, such as tamsulosin, or alfuzacin, and these work by relaxing the alpha receptors in the prostate and bladder neck area. So this diagram from Campbell's shows the alpha A1 receptors, which are the blue dots, and they're very popular around, populous, sorry, around the bladder neck. So by using a drug to relax those and block those, you relieve the obstruction that the prostate can cause, so it's easier and the flow, flow comes out easier. They work very quickly, so they are very useful. But similarly, if people stop them, they'll notice the effect within about 12 to 24 hours. The five ARIs, five alpha reductase inhibitors, work by blocking the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone in the prostate. It works best within bigger prostates, so over 40 cc's, 
Well, that's a PSA of 1.4, but they take six months to work. So that's the, that's the downside. Many men are quite impatient about that. So a study was set up to use them in combination. And this shows time on the bottom axis and then the incidence of progression. And similar curves are seen for the number of people needing an operation, the number of people um, whose disease is getting worse or having a complication. So you can see if you have no treatment, then over the course of the five years, the number of patients, about one in five, are going to get worse. You can reduce that by giving them finasteride, which is a five ARI tablet, as is dutasteride, and or doxazosin, which is an alpha bulkan. And you can see there's pretty similar curves. So the, the blue line, which is the doxazosin, has its effect a bit quicker here. And you can see that the finasteride takes about six months to start to work. So for the placebo and the green line to start to diverge. But when you use them in combination, you get a much more synergistic effect. And the combination therapy is useful for men who have a bigger prostate. So here's another poll. Bond comes back to your clinic six months later with after having conservative treatment. His symptoms are getting worse. So you re-examine him, he's got a big, you know, big benign prostate. His PSA is 2.8, so it's still normal. And you do another IPSS and it's got worse. So what treatment would you offer him? An alpha blocker alone? A combination of an alpha blocker and a 5 ARI? Oxybutynin, which is an anticholinergic medication? Saw palmetto capsules from the health shop? Or a 5 ARI alone, such as finasteride? So please do take a poll. Great, so we've got combination treatments. So that's exactly oops, what I thought as well, because he's got a large group of benign posting. So yeah, so using combination treatment will give you will give you good long lasting results. So moving on from there. I've just mentioned bladder training and anticholinergics as two ways of treating storage symptoms. So this is the urgency and urgent consonants. So this is slightly out of the remit of today's talk, so I'm going to move on. So this is another poll. Who should be referred on to a urologist? So a 50-year-old man whose symptoms are well controlled with lifestyle treatment. 60-year-old man who's on an alpha blocker is doing well. The 70-year-old man who keeps coming back to clinic He's getting worse and he's been in attention once. The man with an abnormal DRE and an abnormal PSA. The man with pancreatic cancer who's having home palliative care who's gone into attention. Perfect. So, yeah, I would agree entirely with that. I think the eight year old man with palliative care is difficult I and mean, he, he may not wish to come up to the hospital, but again, I think it's, you know, depending on how he is, that's, that's something you may or may not wish to consider. But yes, I agree with you about option C and D. Okay, so referral to urology should really be for men who want to consider surgery, either because the tablets aren't working, the symptoms are getting worse, or the have been in retention, or men who worried about may have cancer. So surgical treatment, just to finish through, TORP has been around for about 50 years. It works by putting a camera in, and on the end of there, you've got a little loop. And using diathermy, you scrape the prostate out in little shavings. So you just take a little bit of the prostate out, wash the bits out into the blood, and then wash them out at the end. It's very successful, it's very durable, with a reoperation of about 1% a year. So in 10 years' time, about 10% of men will have needed further surgery. And that's because the benign tissue keeps growing. Two thirds of men will ejaculate backwards into the bladder, and one in 20 men will get erection problems. The downside is it's a one to two day stay in hospital. This is HOLEC that achieves the same goal. So it removes the benign tissue, and does that by cutting through with a laser. So it's a bloodless operation. The balls of tissue then float into the bladder, and they're removed using this piece of equipment called a morselator. It is as successful. And Rhino Pinces Group from Germany 
have shown that at 19 years, it is equivalent to T1B. It has similar side effects, but it is a day case. And this is why it's become very popular. Next, we have Resume. So Resume is a relatively new technology and it uses steam. So we put a, a cystoscope in and a special needle and out at the end of there, there was a small needle, you can then inject steam. So it cooks this bit of the prostate and you then get coagulative necrosis. So it takes a bit of time for you to achieve the full effects of it, but you don't get any erectile problems. And the retreatment rate's not bad, it's about four and a half percent at four years. Again, this is a day case. So this sort of operation could be a viable alternative to taking tablets in younger men. And lastly, we have Eurolift. And that uses these little staples with some nylon to hold the sides of the prostate apart. So you remember from your anatomy, the prostate's made of three lobes, two lateral lobes and a middle lobe. So as long as you don't have a massive middle lobe, this is a pretty good technique. Send a sedation or a slight, or a, sorry, a short anesthetic, no erectile dysfunction. But the published data shows quite a high retreatment rate over, over five years. The newer data suggests that this is going to be lower. Again, this is a dead case. So the tips and the things to, to take away. The history is all important. John Blandy, who was professor of urology at the London Hospital, always used to say, listening is more important than writing. I think that's something which is very important. So by taking a good history, you'll be able to differentiate people who have voiding symptoms, which are the hesitancy and poor flow caused by obstruction, or storage symptoms such as the urgency and urge incontinence. And this can be due to a bladder problem alone or because the bladder is obstructed. And we have a mixture between these two. Simple tests, the IPSS and the frequency volume chart can give a lot of useful information. And for small prostates, think about an alpha blocker, and larger prostates, a fiber ARI in combination with an alpha blocker. And then finally, with surgery, the less invasive options may not be as durable, but they do have less and fewer side effects. So that brings me to the end, and I can see hopefully some questions have come in. And Will, can you, um, can you, can we discuss some questions? So, um, so Stuart, thank you very much for that. That's uh, been very informative. A, a few questions about the history slides, and they will be available via a link on the college website to the webinar. So you'll be able to catch up with those at your uh, um, at a more convenient time um, later on. Um, but the first question about lifestyle measures, Stuart, and then there's a few questions about PSA. Um, Lifestyle measures, is it a good idea for people with troublesome storage symptoms to reduce the amount of fluid they're drinking or is it changing the type and increasing um, good fluids and rather than uh, just reducing fluid intake? I think the problem if you, well firstly it's the type of fluid, so it's cutting out caffeine, caffeinated drinks, very acidic drinks like carbonated drinks and alcohol. These will, all, these will act as diuretics or irritants to the bladder lining. If you restrict fluids, then the, the urine is a great way to get rid of acid. So by restricting fluids, you just make the urine more concentrated, and then it can be less friendly, if you like, to the bladder lining. So I'm not an advocate for restricting fluids, but it's striking a balance of enough fluid, but it has to be good fluid. So preferably not, not caffeinated, or alcoholic or fizzy drinks. Excellent, thank you. And um, so there's been quite a few questions about PSA and obviously there's a, um, we may move on to sort of PSA and how that prostate cancer can be involved. But um, the first question really that uh, people have wanted to know about is, um, is, is PSA, is it specific to bladder outflow obstruction? Or are there any other causes of an elevated PSA? There are loads of causes. So in bladder outlet obstruction, we just use PSA to get an idea of how big the prostate is. So we know if you've got a bigger prostate, then there's more chance that the disease will progress and get worse. And there's a better chance that you'll respond well to five ARI 
tablets such as monasteroid or glutasteroid. Prostate cancer can make the PSA higher, as can inflammation in the prostate, riding a bike, having intercourse. So there are a number of things which can also put the PSA up. Uh, another question that's come through, which has been quite popular, is um, active surveillance and watchful waiting. Now, um, those are prostate cancer management. Mm -hmm. But could you just give us a, a, a couple of lines about the difference between active surveillance and watchful waiting, please? Well, I think in terms of bladder, in terms of bladder outlet obstruction, I think they I think they are pretty they are pretty similar. Um, in the UK, we generally uh, not follow people up too closely, so we may see them to year repeat their IPSS score, maybe repeat a flow rate and a bladder scan to get an idea if their disease is progressing. So that's what we'd usually use by, by observation in bladder outlet obstruction. The terminology uh, which mentions more akin to prostate cancer, and if you're monitoring people with prostate cancer who you don't wish to intervene on with either surgery or radiotherapy. Okay. And watchful <laughs> waiting or active surveillance are, are, are terms which are commonly used in prostate cancer management as opposed to BPH. Okay, thank you. And so just one final question, which has been very popular. Um, we talk about bladder outflow obstruction in men, but does bladder outflow obstruction ever happen in women, uh, Stuart? Yes, I guess it can. If you get, if you get stenosis or narrowing or scarring of the urethra, so the female urethra is very short and there's not a lot along its way to cause any resistance like a man with a prostate. But if you have some injury to it, perhaps secondary to pelvic cancer or surgery and you've got, and you've got a lot of scarring in it, then a similar thing would happen. The bladder would have to work harder so you get hesitancy, poor flow, and you may get secondary urgency and urge incontinence. So yes, it can happen, but it's very rare. And I'd always be, I'd always be cautious about making a diagnosis of bladder outlet obstruction in a female, unless you've probably had a look in with a, with a, with a flexible urethroscope in clinic, or with a flexible cystoscope in clinic. Because if you can look in with a cystoscope, it's not going to be an obstruction that's caused physically. It's much more likely to be one of the other causes such as an underactive bladder or an overactive bladder, a bladder tumour or a distal ureteric stone, which can all cause urinary symptoms. Thank you very much. Um, so we've just got a, about a minute left. So a um, uh, couple of delegates here, they're um, keen to just hear a little bit more about sort of bladder retraining and any details on... Okay. On... Yep, so bladder retraining, there's a great information sheet on the BAUS British Association of Urological Surgeons website which is, tells you all about bladder training but it's where you teach people uh, to learn to hold on so the urge to go and pee will last for about 20 or 30 seconds so you teach people some distraction techniques so they can get through that urge in that 20 or 30 seconds of difficulty it's inexpensive it takes buy-in from the patients, and for motivated patients, it will work very well. In those who it doesn't work, you can supplement that with an anticholinergic medication, such as oxybutynin or solifenacin. And they work by blocking the muscle receptors on the bladder wall, thereby making the bladder less active. They do have fairly considerable side effects, and the dropout rate is about 20 to 30% for oxybutynin. So these are drugs which can be used in combination with bladder training, but used with caution. Well, Stuart, that's, um, you've covered, covered a, a lot of ground there and given a fantastic overview on, um, on the investigations, um, uh, the history, um, initial medical and lifestyle management, as well as surgical options for men with bladder outflow obstruction. So I'd like to thank you very much for putting those slides together. And uh, thank you very much for giving that webinar this afternoon. Um, for those of you who have asked, asked questions, thank you very much. The slides will be available 
as a link uh, on the college website for people to catch up with. Um, but uh, as we've come to the end of our slots, I'd just like to thank Stuart again. Thank you very much. Very for welcome. Thank you very much to the college uh, and the RSA for supporting these webinars and um, good luck with the rest of the series. Thanks very much, Will. Thank you.